Hey everyone, I hope you are well and welcome to the first ever We Are Listening online event. In fact, this is the biggest one we've ever done, so thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Victoria and I'm the founder of We Are Listening and Creative Marketing Manager of Tool and Records. Um, for you that might not know already, so We Are Listening is our female platform and event series to help grow, nurture and find more female talent in the industry. Today we have some amazing panels planned and I hope everyone watching this comes away feeling inspired and comes away feeling that they've, you know, they found the day genuinely useful and helpful. Hello and welcome to How to Break Through as a DJ, where we're going to be talking about everything from how to get gigs to looking after your mental health and also producing. I'm your host, Millie Cotton, and joining us is Jess Bates. Hi! Hi Hello, how everybody. How are you? How are you yeah, good. How are you? I'm really good, thank you, babe. Amazing. Also, is Maxine. Hello. So we've got DJ Paulette as well. You're all right, everyone. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. We've got Alicia. Hello. 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 How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Co yeah, good. Thank you. We've got Molly Collins. What's up? Here she is. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I made it, got, mate. Last but not least, we've got DJ Ray. Hi. So, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining on us on our panel. And a great place to start would be if you could tell us each a bit about yourself and how you got into DJing. Who wants to start, um, ladies? Sorry, <laughs> starting with Alicia. There we go. <laughs> oh, what? How did it start? Sorry, did you say? Yeah, so how did you start DJing? Uh, genuinely started by just buying uh, a £30 controller from Amazon. I thought, I'm going to give this a go. And I thought, why not? Time is now. So, yeah, I literally just bought a controller and, yeah, just self-taught myself in my bedroom. It's been about five years now. Um, I've kind of progressed since then, which is good. <laughs> but, yeah, that's where it all started for me, really, in the bedroom. Nice. And how about you, Molly? Uh, I used to work at a club actually, um, doing like lighting and stuff, and I sort of like decided that I wanted to be the one playing on the deck. So yeah, I, I also bought loads of decks and just shoved them in my room, and uh, taught myself in my bedroom. <laughs> Maxine, how about you? Oh, it's, maybe you're muted. Um, let's move on to Jess while we work out what's going on with Maxine's sound. No uh, Jess, how about you? Um, I was actually tour manager for Sam Divine um, before, so I knew I kind of wanted to get into the music industry before. So I put myself through DJ school um, at Sub Bass and learned that way and got into the industry that way. And Ray? Hey, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Cool. Sorry, I couldn't hear anything earlier. So, um, yeah, so for me, um, it was just a really early love of house music and clubbing and started collecting vinyl back in the day. Lots of people had decks at parties and I was just drawn to them. I'd been sort of doing music at school, so um, it was kind of a natural thing for me to want to know how it all worked and obviously then getting sort of heavier into the music and the club scene and just wanting to be a part of it and um, it was just really really exciting you know obviously it's a part of other things I do in my career but a massive part of it and um, that's just grown through the years you know through the the passion of the music and yeah, so that's how it began, and it was old school traveling around the country, just trying to get gigs wherever you could, and then ended up doing a summer in Ibiza with my trusted record box. And a certain DJ called Sandy Rivera was late for his set, and I was there ready and waited. <laughs> <laughs> so I managed to get in there, and um, obviously, the first gig sparks off massive passion. So you're just kind of driven from that there on. So yeah that's that's me amazing and paulette how about you 
And I've got a really different story to everybody else. I started off um, buying records when I was like seven years old. I've been buying records for a very long time. And um, I got into DJing because of my record collection. Somebody, uh, a friend of mine knew somebody who was putting on a party at the number one club in Manchester and she'd run out of money for the DJ because she'd spent it all on hiring the club. And my friend Tommy told her I had loads of records. So she came and asked me if I would be the DJ for the night. And she offered me 30 quid to play from, I mean, this is in 1991. So she offered me 30 quid to play from nine o'clock in the evening till two o'clock in the morning. And I was studying to do my degree at the time. So I thought 30 quid, it was a lot of money then. So I said, yes. And then I went from playing that party at the number one to the promoters for the flesh night at the Hacienda, heard about this party, heard about the music that I'd played and the girl that organized the party, we both approached the people that were putting on the flesh party and said, can we host your second room? So I went from never having DJed at all to, DJing at the number one club to within months DJing at the Hacienda where I stayed for like four and a half years and that's the Hacienda in Manchester and that's how it began for me. Amazing that is quite a different journey. But how Very incredible. different. Yeah. <laughs> and Maxine can we can hear you, you now? now? Yes I can hear you brilliant. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, like, I'm originally from a really small village on the south coast, so I wasn't really surrounded by like many other DJs or like like a lot of the sort of dance music. So I just I just basically moved to London, and I just chose I just wanted to like immerse myself in it, and I started like learning from home, with sports and equipment, started practicing and mixing from home, and then. Yeah, it was like after about six months, that was when I started putting like mixes out and going to more events. But yeah, it kind of started about five, five or six years ago in, um, in London. For me. And so when you got your first gig, how did you get your first gig and where was it? So for me, um, like it was, I think it's quite important to like go along to the events that you want to be involved in. So like, you know, after like mixing for about six months, you kind of learn what sort of sound you want to be playing out and stuff. Mm. And obviously that evolves over time. But yeah, I think it's just important to go along to the go along to the events and show, you know, show your spot. Be be genuine, you know, if it's, if it's an event you genuinely want to play for, you're going to want to go to them anyway. So yeah, I was just going to a lot of events at the time and then I started meeting other DJs and other um, promoters and then yeah it's just over time build relationships and then I think I've got my first gig it was at um, the Q project in London so it was in like room three there was literally no one in the room um, but it was such a great experience had such a buzz of it um, yeah that was that was the first ever gig and then from there it just led on to another gig. I think the promoter called me back for a second gig. And then, yeah, it was just over time, like networking, building relationships and going to the events that I really wanted to play for. That's that's how it all started to build up. Yeah, sure. And so, Jess, you have, you've, you're like a huge part of Defected and you've released music on Defected. Is your journey similar? Would you say that you you, you went to events and that's how you started as well? So my actual first ever show was the first time I ever played in a club it, on a set of decks was at Ministry of Sound. Wow. So and I and I got that off the back of sub base. So me studying there, they at the end of the course it gives you the ability to be submitted to go and do a warm up set for it was a night called the Gallery at Ministry. Um, so my first initial entry to anywhere outside of the like a studio or my bedroom was Ministry of Sound. So. I was sort of chucked in at the deep end, which was great. It was a great learning curve because I was never ready for that massive sound system to hit me in the face. I would never forget it my whole life. But um, I guess the, when, because Sam was my best friend, working with her and I, I just sort of, I came into Defected from, from working behind the scenes, I guess. So I just, they they took notice of me because I was I was there and I was present and I was always working the events anyway, looking after Sam. 
And I just naturally started to do the warm up shows for her when she started a label Divine Sounds. It was like it just it just naturally happened and it's been such a fun ride. Like it's been the most amazing journey and I'm just yeah, I'm very grateful for everything that's happened. How would you say that you warm up how would you master a warm up set? What's different to playing a warm up set to playing to headlining? I still to this day always prefer to warm up than play a headline slot. Like there's there's no doubt in my mind that like a warm up is the one. And it's it's actually something that Sam's taught me through and through. Like warm up is key and now it's just it's so amazing to be able to build the night from the start because that's where you start the night. You don't come into a club ready to rave 100%. You, you need to be eased in. And that's where you learn how to DJ and that's where you get to play the best records because people are always so so in like in tune of making bangers, but who makes the warm-up records? Those are those guys are the unsung heroes and warm-up is so important. So like, that is the main thing to learn your craft at. Alicia, how about you? So what was your first gig? And then also warm-up sets, have you done lots of them or and how do you feel about them? Yeah, well, my first gig was actually, it, was, it wasn't it was even meant to happen. I just was going out um, on a Tuesday night actually and um, I'd been just obviously practicing my room and stuff. Um, but the guys who, who actually did the event were like, oh, do you want to just jump on? And I was like, oh okay so yeah I just played for I think about 45 minutes just obviously like with the commercial stuff but I loved it because it just it kind of it just taught me a lot when you're like on the job like I'd never played to anyone anyone before so I'd just kind of gone from playing in my room to just playing to a load of people I didn't have like a, my USB or anything on me I was just using the guy's music that, that was there so I was just kind of winging it but yeah it's kind of all an experience and that's kind of what what craft you're sounding today and yeah with uh, with warm-up sets I, I agree with Jess they, they're they the most important set of the night I think for me because if you if you set the tone perfectly for the party then the, the whole music's just going to flow from then so yeah I love warming up warming up um for you know two hours or so and and I get to play stuff that I, I never usually get to play because you can't play the same records really that you play in a, in a peak time headline set so yeah I love, I love, I love playing regardless. So yeah, give yeah, me, sure. yeah. Ray, how about you? Um, to be honest, I've been thrown in most of my life into the deep end with everything that I've done. So, um, I, I kind of um, went into, I suppose, in the early days, it was a lot of kind of just sort of getting into the after hours clubs and playing at ridiculous times through the night and you'd literally just get into this like mad atmosphere whirlwind throw yourself in get involved like I can't actually remember ever well hardly ever being somewhere sort of early <laughs> we like always on sociable mad hours like I'd get sort of four or five a.m slots and I'd be like going to all my mates come on you'll be all right we can do this and they'd just all be like wasted by sort of two three and I'm there on my own like come on guys so that was like the early sort of stuff and then um from sort of being um a vocalist and having sort of PAs I kind of, then it was sort of like, I've always been DJing, but it kind of wasn't always known. So I had to kind of establish myself in different areas of my career throughout the sort of time mm. as well. So it'd be like, okay, I'll do a PA and then let's try and combine the two. And that sort of seemed to work quite well. So for that sort of thing, it was always kind of peak time slots, you know, people wanted to kind of embrace the live performance as well when they sort of, in those sort of mad moments of middle of the club, I guess. So um, I would definitely say from sort of travelling through all the years to different places all around the world, you get to experience that warm up set as well a lot more when you're outside of the country, you know, different time zones and you want to be there to sort of see the whole night and get a feel for that country's vibe as well. Um, so I definitely agree with what the, the girls have said so far that how important it is to set up the night and the atmosphere because if you get that bit wrong, you are playing catch-up for the rest of the night and it's so hard to kind of pull that 
vibe back into the room if it's kind of gone a little bit AWOL by the time you're there, you know. So um, I think extremely important every stage of the night, you know, and if you get the joy to play the whole night, like, you know, you realise then it's a journey. And like you say, there's records that you might not get to play at those sort of 2, 3 a.m. slots that are just beautiful at the beginning, the end, you know. So there's definitely, I think, every set of the night is really important. So say you're getting booked for the warm-up slots, you're starting to play more. When do you realise that it's the right time to go full-time? I mean, Maxine, when did you decide to go full-time? Um, I think it's, it's not really... I think that I, there wasn't a moment where I was like, right, I'm going to decide necessarily. It just it just gradually built up over time. Um, but I do remember after I finished my after I finished my university degree, it was either go into um, like a full time career or pursue music and put everything into that. So um, yeah, it was when I was at university that's when I was starting to learn how to produce. And I got really into production and I was DJing around London at that time. And um, yeah, for me, I, I just wanted to, put, I wanted to throw everything into production. So yeah, it was around like 2016, I've just finished university. And um, I actually moved to Ibiza for the winter season. So like usually people go to Ibiza for the summer season um, when it's all open, but my friend lives out there and uh, he was like, why don't you move over here in the winter and do your productions from home um, and then use it as a chance to network? Because on the island, um, there's actually like a lot of um, the local residents that you know work there all year round. They live there in the winter as well. Mm. So it was a great, great time to go over there, focus on production and really find my sound and also just, yeah, just network and meet people on the island and some really good things come out of that like um you know some gigs on the island and networks that i'm still connected with now so yeah i think it was around like 2016 was probably when i started to put more time into it um but yeah just sort of gradually over time it's become more of a full-time thing um, but i love it you know there's there's so many aspects of like the music industry it's, it's not just not just DJ and production, like there's, there's the business side of it, like there's so many things that you can do. And um, through the through the pandemic, obviously we've had like all all this you know time where the, where, where we haven't had gigs, but it's, mm. it's not been a bad thing at all because you know there's so many other aspects that you can focus on and put your energy into. Yeah, and carrying on with production. Um, so how important do we think it is to be a producer, to be a successful DJ now? Do you think that you have to produce as well? I personally, I think, I think like production isn't for everyone, you know, like some people, they just want to focus on being a great DJ and, that, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but I think where there is a lot of DJs now, like it's, it's important to have like some kind of identity. So if it is just DJ and you want to focus on like have, have identity in like the way you mix or it might be your branding or something but um yeah i think with with production i think it definitely helps because it's, it's great to be able to play your own music out you know there's no there's no feeling like it being able to play your own music out and um yeah just just being able to create your own sound have your own identity so i think you know when i kind of look up to look at the people that I, you know, inspire me, they, you know, they have all had their own tracks out. So when I was getting into DJing, I was like, oh, you know, that person, you know, they do release their own music, they've got their own sound. And that was also always something that inspired me. So, um, yeah, I think if, if you are interested in production, I think definitely get into it because it does open up a lot more opportunities um, if, if you're a DJ. But there's nothing wrong if you are, you know, you just want to focus on DJing, then, you know, you can, you can do that as well. Molly, would you say that's the same? One of your tracks has just had over half a million streams, if I'm correct, right? That's huge. So what, of, yeah, massive. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. So what, have you seen more opportunities come through the door since you've started producing music? 
Um, yeah, like I come through as a DJ, like first, and it's very rare to come through as a DJ because obviously a lot of people do make tunes, and the people who make tunes generally get booked, like for shows. Um, but yeah, like it was rare for me to come through just as a DJ, but then I think like you can just carry on as a DJ, but I think you get to a certain point and you either want more or you just never really go past that line, in my opinion, like as a DJ, um, especially in this day and age where there's so many talented producers just making bangers left, right and centre. Like it, it is like, it is crazy the music, like how well everyone's doing at the moment, especially because no one's DJ and so everyone's just putting out tunes like, um, but I think like if you just want to DJ, like you can just DJ, like you don't. There's not a rule that says you have to produce. But I think for me, it was like I'm at a point now with DJing where I actually want to learn how to make tunes. You know, so I started learning how to make tunes, and and it's definitely helped my career like hundred percent. It's definitely helps open doors, um, not just with playing better shows, but like I don't know like radio and meeting new people, working with like other talented singer-songwriters and things like that. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, definitely. And collaboration is so, so important. So for, have you collaborated on any tracks with anyone recently? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. <laughs> I've got a few. Why don't you ask Jess? Because I know she's got a new tune coming out. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about well, your new tune. Molly has actually introed me to the most amazing vocalist ever, Leah Guest. She's incredible. Um, I've been working with her like behind the scenes. Nothing's announced yet, but yeah, thanks to Molly for that link up. She's so insane. Alicia, how about you? What are you working on production wise at the moment? As Maxine said, like just making start making the time and using it wisely really because beforehand obviously with, with all the gigs and stuff we just we wouldn't we've all made so much music now that we probably would never have made if the pandemic didn't happen so yeah i'm just making just so much mu as much music as i can um just for you know back to in the clubs really where i can just play most of my own production because before i just wouldn't really have the confidence to um but now it's just a whole different ball game i can't wait but in terms of like collab collaborations i love collabing with obviously people um you know friends of mine that are like kind of wanting to go in the same direction as me and um and obviously we're good friends and we've got a similar style too so that's when i like to make music because you just bounce off each other and a track just comes together so quickly i don't really work with vocalists as much as you know like jess and, and maxine and molly probably do um but yeah i just I just make loads of music in general and just whatever you I'm make bangers mate <laughs> Non vocal oh, bangers. bangers for days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, it's 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 like everyone's got their own kind of vision and, and style, isn't it? And I'd love to work with a vocalist, genuinely. I'd love to see you work with a vocalist, to be honest. I really well, would. Why don't you sing on one of my tunes? You know what? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I don't think. I don't necessarily think like you know. I don't think every track has to have a vocal though do you know what i mean you can make um, yeah it's a time and a place isn't it it's time and a yeah. place yeah. And that's the thing, like, I do, I do genuinely love vocals in my tracks. I think every track I make, I have a vocal in it because that's just my sound, you know. I just mm -hmm. like them them little vocals. But in terms of, like, a, a big kind of lead vocal, it's just, I would like to work with it in the future. Just right now, I haven't really thought about it, you know. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I just like collaborating with other producers and just, we make, like, the club records, like, that. you know, that's what mm -hmm. I like. Make, DC like, 10, 6am vibes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot yeah. of my, a lot of my music is like vocal led tunes, like so. You can't beat it. Song. You can't you literally yeah. can't beat it. Like yeah. I don't really play even when I play sets, I don't play kind of stuff without vocal. It's always got a vocal in it, whether it's just a, a tiny little sample or it's a, quite quite big on the break. That's just what I like. Um just it just hasn't been one of them things where I've wanted to work with them as of yet. But in future, like, I probably will, because as Molly said, like, you get to a point where you've done so much with your own sound, you're like, yeah. well, what I'll do now to, like, kind of break another barrier or yeah, sure. like, just keep your own personal self, because that's what we all do. We make music for ourselves. And then if it happens to, to be liked and to be streamed millions of times, like Molly and Jesse's, do you know what I mean? Then it's good. We've done a good job. So, yeah. I think, 
I was just going to say it's also important to not forget those amazing records that will last forever that have no vocal in them at all, 100%. though. They are like, like coming from vocal. Nine Toes Finder. <laughs> So, yeah, for me, for me actually coming as a singer, vocalist as well, I also, you know, I have that balance. Like I think songs are so important in our world, but there's also always room for those instrumentals that just take your... How beautiful is that when you can, you know, do something with just music as well? And also just to, I, I think this panel is quite important to to get the message across to people as well that might be considering the whole DJ world. Um, DJing in itself is an art form and it, that shouldn't be overlooked. You know, it's a really important role, like it's an art, it really is, you know, and it's always been sort of that way from right back in the day. And the reason why, uh, people diversify through the years is because we have to you know the industry is so saturated and so busy you you know you'd really struggle to just be a DJ in these kind of competitive times you know how the industry's changed over the years so you know you can still come into it wanting to just be a DJ and own in on that craft and be really good at what you do without being diverted elsewhere but you may have to diversify because there's it's really tough. You know, like we, I'm sure all of us know very few people who just survive on DJing, whereas maybe 10, 20 years ago, there were DJs absolutely smashing it just from playing. I say just from playing, but, you know, playing, that, that is a really important part of it all. So we should always come back to that when we're talking about these kind of panels. And say we're like you're putting out tracks, you're you're getting booked. So when do you need someone to represent you, uh, Paula? How when did you first get representation? Um, I've never actually had management ever in my c entire career. I've had booking agents all the way through. Um, I think the first time I was represented was probably around 1994, 95, and I was represented by Concord. And that was just straight after the Hacienda. So, um, but I think generally they come to you. It's not something that you can go and say, hey, I'm a DJ, will you represent me? That generally people have to look at you and say, oh, well, she's got something I think we can work with her, whether you're doing radio or if you have your own party or if you, you're a producer generally people come to you so you can't really make the decision other people make that decision for you but what i would say is if you have a radio show or if you have a sound cloud or a mixed cloud and you've got really massive audience and that's taking off then that is a point where you've got leverage to go and speak to people rather than them coming to to you but for me it, it came off the back of working at a really good residency so 94 was when it started then I had a different agents all the way through up until 2000 and then when I went to Paris 2004 I had a book I had an agent almost straight away from 2004 and I kept the same one till 2013 and then back in the UK I've been I've gone back to working with them in 2S. So, um, yeah, I've kind of had one all the way along, but they come to you. It's not a decision that you um, wake up one day and say, I think I should have a booking agent now. It has, you have to have something underneath it. You have to have something really solid behind you before you can get a booking agent or a manager. Yeah, sure. Is that something that everyone else has found? Has everyone else got managers and agents? And then yeah, what, I think um, so. Yeah, yeah. it was like I I was at the point where I had an agent because like my bookings I I didn't. It got to a point where I was friends with all the promoters and I didn't like to talk money. So it was mm -hmm. like you need you need somebody to cut out the middleman and also that that person then really shows your worth and he like he'll he'll drive your your fee up financially because there there are levels that you need to progress onto and. 
it's often harder to do it on your own. But getting management was something that was really scary for me. It's like, when do you know you're ready? But then when I signed my management it was 12 months ago. And it's like the, the, my whole career is done a flip. It's like something has happened and it's like the best thing I've ever done. So I think you're, I think you just know as an artist when you need to be managed by somebody. When you, when you, you have so much create, creativity going on in your brain, you just need somebody to put it all in, in an order for you and tell you this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to get to the goal. And mm. I'm so lucky with my manager that he's absolutely incredible. Um, but, yeah, you just know. Like, you'll know in your gut. You know but did he come to you or did you go to him? So I was kind of shopping. It was I said to my agent, I I'm, I'm think I'm ready. And um, it was actually through a friend that, that we met that, that I found out that they were going to launch. It was through, um, so my company is called Reset the Night, which is part of Labelworks. Um, so I worked with Labelworks because I was running Divide Sounds for Sam. So we were friends before, and then I knew they were going to launch the management side. So we just sat down, and I, I met with a few managers before. And I think when you sit with them, like you know because this person is going to come in and they are going to be like the new person that is like yeah. my manager is the first person I text in the morning and the last person I text before I go to bed I'm so you, it, I yeah <laughs> it needs to be okay. up and obviously I do <laughs> but it, it needs to be somebody that you click with and as soon as I sat down with my manager I, I knew straight away I was like you're the one for me like this is it and yeah I've not looked back since it was the best decision I ever made do you know what's it's, it's weird because you you had an agent first before a manager. And you had I, a manager first, right? I had a manager first yeah. before an agent because, and I think it's important for people watching as well that it's okay to say like no to, to the opportunities that come your 100%. way. Like as you said, like it's a weird thing, but you you, you just know because like you say no to like quite a few people if you know if it comes, and then that one person will come to you with like their direction for, for you, and you'll just know it's 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 just really it's a really weird feeling because I was like yeah I think I think you're the one, but um yeah it's so weird because my manager did the management and agent side for a very long time so because we wasn't ready for an agent do you know what I mean like I thought I wasn't ready for an agent but then you get to that point of your career where it's like okay now it's time to step but I think because quite a lot of people have someone representing them everyone else looks in and think I need someone mm -hmm. representing them and it's not yeah. because there's still the biggest artists in the world still don't have managers or an agent they'll just have one or the other you know, yeah. like I think Camel Fat don't have management, or they don't have it's one or the other. I was just going to say that I'm pretty sure Camel Fat don't have manager. Yeah. And you look at them, for example. So it's not like a must. It's just sometimes if, you, if no you, management is better than bad management. It's yeah, well, that, that's Amen. what I was going to say, Ray. It's, it's, it's not that I haven't had a manager. I've been approached by managers and. It's just been like when we've talked about it, it's been like, yeah, you know what really not exactly. for me. Yeah. Not for yeah. me. I don't think this is gonna work. Yeah. So and always yeah. always trust your gut with this because yeah. that person is gonna 100%. be the one that's gonna really be the driving force behind your your brain essentially. So yeah, if you're if you don't if you sit with them and you think no, then trust it. 100%. It's like a relationship and people don't realise, like it's, I don't want to say as important as the, as the love of your life, but it's it's insane. Insane. Oh you my know. God, it is. I'm basically yeah. married. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I'm married to a man and a woman at the same yeah. time. <laughs> you, you can't just go out and go, I want a manager and he's got to be this, that, or she's got to be this, that. It's like it has to feel good, feel yeah. right. Absolutely. To a point, you know, I think that, like, if you like, you get to a point as well by going through the process of maybe getting the wrong management here and there, you get really good at managing yourself. Absolutely. So, you know, and that is also why I think, um, you know, you've said it's a relationship, and there are points where you will change from one manager or one agent to another. And, like you say, that relationship is really important because yeah. it can end really badly and it is like i've yeah. seen it end badly on a oh i've had it end yeah really yeah, badly. yeah. yeah I, and trust me it was ugly so you don't it's horrible that. that's, like, that's one thing that stopped me from going into it because i've seen it happen to yeah. other people and it, it made me nervous to to, to enter that world and I, yeah i've been I lucky and i'm sorry to hear that you've had a rough time with one yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
for people, <laughs> for people who are thinking about management as well, like don't be too scared because like relationships, you don't often go through your whole, whole life with just one and go, you know, how lucky are you? <laughs> You've had that one person your whole life. Fair <laughs> to it. I know people who've done it and I know people who've had the same manager all their career and I'm like, wow, you're so lucky. Like you've missed a whole world of SH. You know, <laughs> so so don't be scared for a little bit of uh, trial and error. We can't always get it right, you know. And sometimes you learn a lot from those not so right relationships. Yeah, and I would definitely say don't go for the first one that comes. No. <laughs> don't no. shop around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with agents, so something wasn't clicking right, and I, I didn't know what was clicking. And then when my agent came along this one, and it was because she's a woman, and I was like, "You are what I need on my team." <laughs> That's why I said no before, because they just get you. And uh, yeah. you, have to, you have to, as you said, shop around in the most horrible way of saying it. Because yeah, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. You've got to go with your gut feeling and what no one else kind of tells you to do. And like you said, a really valid point. Don't be scared to say no. That really means that if you take what you do seriously enough and you have enough belief in yourself to be like, I know the right thing will come along. It might not be now. I can wait a bit longer for that. You know, that's real sort of empowering stuff for people starting out now that maybe some of us had to learn along the way, you know. Yeah, say no and, and better things will be around the corner. Yeah, it's, it's so hard that though. It's the smallest word, one of the smallest words in the dictionary, and the hardest word to say is no. Oh no. my God, yes. I, I'm <laughs> loving this now. It's yeah, so hard to say no. I'm mm. terrible at it because I want to do every show that comes in, I want to do everything because mm. I'm just so excited <laughs> about what I'm doing. But it's and my it's, agent tells me this sometimes you have to say no to. to to progress yeah it's because hard. you're just washing yourself out of it's time hard. and time, I play. time yeah. is so on the, on the saying, on so the saying on, no and looking after yourself because you're so busy you're like working so like, like such long hours such late nights how do you look after yourself like saying no is definitely a good way to start yeah. right by like time management and yeah yeah, go dog walking, swimming, cooking, reading, <laughs> just anything. So the first thing is switch your phone off. I need to learn yeah. this better. Switch your phone off. That's the best. And so, oh, oh. Used to be like my mum. My mum rings me every single night. No joke. So get off your phone. Switch your phone. Switch, I'm like, mum, it's seven o'clock. Like I've, I've still got so many emails. I need to. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it is, but it's the best advice, and it, it's it a is. weird one. But even if it's only for an hour yeah. or two hours, you yeah. know, just to get that break where you can come away from yeah. it and where you realize that, um, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, it's not important for no, two or three not. hours uh, where you can shelve it and say, I am important for these three hours, and, and yeah. what I want to do right now is watch line of duty with a box of chocolates <laughs> and that's great it. choice yeah. it's, like, you know. it's, quite, it's letting the mind breathe isn't it because we don't yeah. realize how you know the tick tick process of literally just checking on your socials in the middle of a break or something i think lockdown like, gave us that moment. lockdown definitely played a massive part in in our industry as a whole in realizing you need to put the brakes on. Yeah. Like you have to, otherwise we're going to burn out. And yeah, um, it's something that I'm super, super passionate about, mental health wise, because I've had my battles when I've been growing right. up, and I still battle every day. So every day, it's, yeah, it's something that if it wasn't for this year having the freeze of everything, that now we need to deal with our emotions and what's going on. If I don't know how I would have continued going forward if I hadn't had this break and realised that what I was doing was just burning myself out. Mm. So if anything. I'm a little bit nervous to go back to touring. I'm not, I'm not, I won't even lie yeah. about it. I'm, like, the diary, like my July is, is terrifyingly busy. And I'm like, oh, I'm a bit anxious about it because I, do, I don't know how to do it anymore. I'm yeah. totally out of practice for a whole year. And yeah. it's just, everyone's it gets, the same though. It's the same, but yeah. now we need, to, we need to look after each other. We need to look after each other and 
make yeah. sure that everybody else is all right and yeah that's, it's just that's the really important thing about now is that we know that we can share it whatever we yes. get through you can put it out there and someone out there will respond and will be able yeah. to talk and listen yeah, someone will catch you yeah. they always do yeah. there's always well, someone actually, they i'm do. actually gonna start doing i'm launching a podcast very soon where i'm gonna have each month a different artist or anybody from the entertainment industry talking about any kind of struggles that they've had within this industry and their mm. personal life so if any of you ladies want to come on and chat please Happily. drop me a message yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll do it. i would love to have you yeah, cool. yeah. Well, yeah. Anytime. Is anytime i mean particularly on the mental health thing because yeah, sure. what That's people what it's going to be heavily involved forget yeah. is that this career we all love it we do it because we love it because, yeah but I would not make any secret to anyone about Absolutely. That's the how point of the podcast. hard the work is. That's you the point have of the got podcast. to put the work in and it's hours, hours, yeah. hours it's listening fun. to music, making tunes, yeah. traveling and being on your own yeah. in a hotel, on a train, on a plane. There's a know, reason why the suicide head. rate in the music industry it's is really crazy high. high. So it, yeah. and we need to be so real about that. And that's for something that I'm going to absolutely channel in putting this podcast out so i would love to have you in it yeah pleasure. also yeah. with um with comparison how does everyone save themselves for, for like from comparing with each other because oh, oh god that's that, a... it's quite difficult right <laughs> <laughs> I I that's that. the hardest thing I'm, in the world i used to do it quite a lot and i think if it's it's just a normal thing that happens it automatically just when you start and then you start you got going on the same level as other people and then you're they're getting stuff that you want and it's just like you, you just find yourself automatically doing it you don't yeah it's just it's just normal but you, you know, know, you know what, listen, I, I actually thought about exactly this the other day like why is it so much more difficult still for women in the industry and one of the big factors is that we get compared all the time yeah, whether yeah. we like it or not so even yeah. if we were like the most placid all female embracing person ever you're still going to be compared like I'll be compared to the next woman and you know oh anybody close to you in that lane like you get compared and I'm not saying mm. it's just by men it's yeah. not not so much a man woman thing but we do and men don't get that so much yes, they don't true. Get that. well I never forget once a one highlight of mine when I was coming up the ranks obviously because I was working so closely with Sam Devine Somebody, a promoter referred to me as a cheap version of Sam Devine. Oh God, and that no is one. not what I am. That's not what we were working That's towards. totally rude. Exactly. No, she totally she rude. was helping me find myself, and that is not what the goal was. And, and it sticks. It does stick Yeah, with you. it doesn't matter. That's it's just horrible. rude. It's but that's, horrible. That, that's the BS that women get. It really oh is the goodness. BS that women get. That's this, is a whole of a, this is a whole of a chat. Yeah, it's because we're all. Yeah. It is awesome. Oh, yeah. Men don't get that. Men no, do not, not get that. Not ever. At all. Ever. And, not also, at all. and also how difficult it is to just be a woman in this industry. Mm, yeah. <laughs> taken seriously for a long amount of time you know because we are I mean that's still ongoing we've evolved a lot in the sort of last 10 years but there's a, still a long way to go and so right now what we all do is so important and I'm we, sorry I think Jess it's, that's yeah. honestly made I know. my hackles rise <laughs> like yeah, so, up now. Maybe how rude is that? Terrible, terrible. And it was, from, and it was from somebody that is. It was a big. It was a big person as well. So it was. It was heart. It was heartbreaking. And wow. And do you know what's nice about it though? Is I notice now more behind the scenes. There's more women coming through. Mm. Like for example, like um the the a and r is all women at armada like radio is great and then being caught is all ladies so it's like there's more women there coming through so it's we're slowly getting there we're slowly and, getting there and also luckily for us there are really good men in the world that want yes. to help us a you absolutely know, and that they want us to get on a level with them like absolutely you know, and I'm so like grateful for those kind of guys because let's be honest. I mean, sort of. I don't know what it's like right now. Very different, I would imagine. But sort of 10, 20 years ago, you really sort of depended on men for a lot of things, like just to get your foot in certain doors. Yeah. And luckily, there's I think you still do depending on the genre yeah. you're working in. Certain yeah, genres so have more women than others, you know. Yeah. So, but there's always been good guys around. That's yeah. Been 
for your talent, not just for being a woman. Do you know what? I feel like Molly can probably give us an insight on this because drum and bass, I feel, is majorly a male's world. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah How do know. you feel? <laughs> oh, I don't know, man. I, it's like with drum and bass, you've got to be very like tough. Like if you want to yeah. come through, you got to come through. Not you got to be, be prepared to take shit. Like, that's yeah. what I can say. Like, I've, I've, I've had a lot of shit, like, but I don't care. Like, I'm doing my thing. I love what I'm doing. So, I don't care. That's exactly Would that. you say there are any, any like, specific barriers that you've faced or experiences that you can share? Um, I don't know. I think just, like, everyone's, like, the main thing is, oh, she's a girl. She's only doing what she's doing because she's a girl. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the main mm. Main thing, but I never really push almost like tokenism. Yeah, but I've never like really pushed myself as a female artist. Like I'm an artist. Like I don't care if I'm female or not. But like it's a weird one because as like literally 2021, like there there's so many female drum and bass artists coming through. Like considering when I started like six years ago, like there was very minor. But now like there's so many. I feel like barriers are being broken and they are being accepted. Like female i mean we're still lacking female producers there's not as many like but i think like a lot of females don't want to sit there playing around with a snare for ages and stuff you know what i mean like it's not really like a lot of people's fun like Amen. but dj and like female djs there's a lot coming through now in drum and bass which is wicked like you know so it's definitely getting better I was just going to say, I feel like it should, it, it really should be taken seriously to wipe out the sort of comparison of male, female. Like, are they. It really infuriates me when it's like all female DJ lineup. Why? Yeah, no, it I don't, would not I don't be all that, male man. lineup. It would I never be that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that's because it's normally all male, so they have to make. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would never be like male lineup. What? Because okay. it just is. Because it just <laughs> is. Like, <laughs> Women yeah, so are true. programming beats as well. Wow, I know. It's yeah. <laughs> so we only have we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions from the audience. Um, yeah, we've definitely already overrun, so this is great though. So, <laughs> what is your favourite venue you've ever played, Maxine? Uh, it's probably it's either Studio Three Three A or maybe Eden, Eden in our Beaver, so the residency there. Um, yeah, the sound system there is incredible. Same with 338. So, yeah, it's probably those two. Ray, how about you? Um, it would have to be Pasha in Ibiza because I had the most goosebump moments just from sort of being there as a clubber and then being on the other side of it and feeling that insane energy when the sun's coming up and you're in Ibiza and it's just, yeah, that's that was definitely the goosebumps for me. Jess? XOYO, there's nothing that touches it for me in London. Nothing. I love that. Nice Favourite. Alicia? Um, it's so difficult, but I think Fabric. Um, I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll always have such a special place, I think, in my heart. It's just, it's just an iconic venue, and I'm so glad it reopened from that time we thought we were going to lose it. So, yeah, Fabric for me. Paula? Um, well, I'd say the Hacienda just because of nostalgia. I'd say Cocoon because seriously, like Cocoon in Frankfurt, it closed in 2012, but it, is, it was seriously the best club that I have ever played in, been to, eaten in. It was just Fantastic Michelin starred restaurant, dance what? floor in, in, a club? in a nightclub. It was <laughs> badass, badass. Cocoon wow. in Frankfurt was badass, and I played there so many times. The DJ booth had its own VIP area upstairs, it had its own toilet, it had everything you needed. It was absolutely spot on. Best club I've ever played in, and I've played in a lot of really good clubs, but that one just nixes it for everybody smash sure it. amazing and then finally so how did everyone first fund their equipment i was i was presenting a show on tv and i used my first paycheck to buy my first set of decks and the speakers and everything and yeah that's I, think how I, got, I, I got mine on finance i'm pretty sure 
Yeah, oh, yeah, finance. Well, uh, yeah, finance them. You can finance decks so cheap now. Yeah. Who pays full wax? If anyone pays full wax for decks, they're nuts. You will be now. Four hundred Magazine, how about you? Yeah, I think it was just over time I just saved that money. But you can get equipment now, like second hand. It's, it's not too much, you know. Like brand new, it's thousands. Like second hand, a few hundred pounds, just to get you started, learn the basics. You know, you can get going off that. I mean, I didn't even have decks when I started. I like back in ninety one, ninety two. I didn't have decks yeah, for years. Yeah, I didn't for years. I had to go to studios. I, don't, I was I don't, like pretending wow. on like uh, hi-fi and another, I, I just put two hi-fis together just to try and figure out how to beat match until yeah. I could afford my own deck. That's amazing. Serious. <laughs> it was, it was roots. It was total gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But I think that's all we have time for, but thank you so much to you all. This has been so cool and like, I love all your music and all your sets and like so to talk to you has been incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, really nice always. to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. And for everyone watching, so next up is how to connect with your audience through marketing with Laura Davy from The Kind, Camilla May from Relentless Energy, Mind Sounds, Rigi from Amada Records, Nicole from Dirty Bird Records, and Tall Room's own creative manager Victoria. So stay tuned yeah, and thank you so much. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye.